How's it going up there? Are you staying safe with the COVID and everything? Yeah, it's, uh, as you know, the, thanks to the nitwits in the state legislature and uh, assorted other nitwits, <laughs> it's really sweeping through the state. And uh, staying safe means staying very, very insular. Yeah, it's, We're more prepared, I think, than some of our friends who are more instinctually so- social minded. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I feel that as someone who is more instinctually socially minded and who had a, you know, we used to have a community center here up and rolling with events every day of the week. And that's been a big change yeah. for Sergio and I over the last nine months. But yep. well, let's, yep. let's, I uh, to live through it. let's jump straight, straight into it. I listened to the, our interview again from last time and uh-huh. we sort of left off in 1975, 1976, the bicentennial year uh, of the U S. So I'm, I would like to go into what not only what you were doing at that time, you know, post the 1975-76 Carter's coming into office, um, the left is sort of on its way out in terms of the kind of power or influence that it had in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, there's oil shocks, uh, crises in the Middle East. I mean, there's a ton of stuff happening uh, in the late 70s leading up to uh, the early 80s. I'm wondering, what were you doing at that time and also... What were you making of the situation, you know, the, the broader political situation in the United States? Well, I was uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, in the midst of a blue collar, a deeply blue collar state with a deep blue collar history going back to the dawn of the Industrial Revolution in North America and a textile economy that had been declining since uh, 1910 but was pumped back up by uh, first the First World War and then the Second World War. But by the 60s and 70s, 50s, 60s and 70s was pretty much on its last leg. And on the other hand, I was in a, a broader Rhode Island blue collar community that had generations of real social solidarity uh, of uh, the bosses mainly being Protestants and the uh, industrial population, mainly being Catholics, which reinforced the the sense of, of of class solidarity. And like a lot of other people my age, who had these grand hopes and and involvements from the late '60s until the early to mid uh, '70s, we were very much thrown back and found ourselves trying to dig in and dig down locally. And my activity was had begun to be around labor education and labor solidarity and tending towards uh, labor history because the labor history in front of us was so incredibly rich and because it still had a, a broader meaning in the lives of uh, ordinary people in Rhode Island than in many other places, a little more like a British situation, you might say, than a, than a U.S. situation. So, you know, there were plenty of committees to join in terms of uh, environmental stuff, uh, even in terms of preservation of existing architecture, which brought progressives together with people who we never really expected to be uh, dealing with, uh, and uh, other kinds of uh, uh, pursuits uh, around the uh, do- doom and gloom that was to come with uh, uh, with the Reagan era, but meanwhile, our labor solidarity movement, uh, community labor organizing committee, was uh, highly effective and brought together community members, that is, longtime blue collar workers, with what I would describe as people from the outside, and we had these wonderful big meetings. And all of the community members were still smoking cigarettes, and all of the people from the outside had stopped smoking cigarettes. So you could sort of see what the crowd was. Uh, and it, it carried on until the Brown and Sharp strike, which was the largest uh, longstanding strike in the U.S. at, the, at its time, 1979 to 1982. Uh, a grand old uh, factory uh, business of uh, machine tool parts and a grand old AFL union and a new management faced with the reality of, of Japanese competition decided to bust the union. And this set loose a lot of events in the state, uh, big picket lines, uh, and 
a, a lot of possibilities for labor education. And ultimately, as in so many of these other cases, the, the strike was lost, but I was able to, to write about for the Nation magazine. And uh, it was a, a vivid moment that by the early 1980s passed and the organization that had been created with great effort more or less disappeared. And, and I had to start thinking about other things. Um, so uh, I wanted to try to find other ways to dig down, dig deeper. What is it that we were missing that we had not connected with in the uh, 1960s and 70s? Now, last time I mentioned the oral history of the American left that I launched in 1975 at New York University. And I probably also uh, mentioned the cultural magazine that I launched in also in 1975 and that was published out of a, a bookstore in uh, in Providence, Rhode Island. In both cases, uh, we were looking for something uh, in, in the, and in a way very related to the Rhode Island Labor History Society, a, a very blue collar organization. Um, we were looking for something that we had o overlooked before. Maybe it was deep in the history of the solidarity of ethnic groups uh, and neighborhoods uh, now wiped away. Maybe it was deep within uh, elements of popular culture, which were not usually seen to be political or even interesting by American intellectuals. Uh, and uh, maybe it was somewhere else in trying to hold on to the, the, the villages and neighborhoods that were beset by uh, terrible misdevelopment uh, plans. But uh, uh, finding those clues but for my sake, finding people to write articles about those clues, uh, but also networking with people in, in Rhode Island more immediately who were working on these issues. These were pretty uh, overwhelming to me. And I would say that we scarcely knew that a Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee was making a, a foremost effort in the 1978 uh, midterm convention of the Democratic Party to insert a sort of major labor environmental set of, of platforms uh, and mildly critical of U.S. foreign policy within the Carter administration to push the Carter administration to adopt what they had promised in their platform and then promptly abandon and uh, along many lines. After that, the midterm conventions were abolished and the high point had been reached by that wing of the so of the mildly reformist but still sort of promising uh, uh, socialist movement. And it was destiny that uh, DSOC was going to merge with the New American Movement, a more new left uh, originated force to create in 1983 uh, the New American Movement. And I wasn't too slow in joining it in 1984. Uh, I was maybe one of the most enthusiastic members to uh, get active with the campaign of George McGovern for the uh, Democratic nomination in, in 1984 and found myself in the amazing situation of being a state labor liaison for a Walter Mondale, who, who was nothing but a junior version of a Hubert Humphrey and just as much of a hawk and just as much of a dull, unelectable character. But uh, I obviously had swung from uh, new left activism and wild expectations, the early 70s, into something far milder but you could say dug down deeper into the soil that was around me. And, and that would make me a pretty normal character for those days. I think a lot of us are in, a same, in the same position today following the elections uh, that just happened. I, I think that's right. I think that's right. And the question is whether it's possible to keep the, the high vision in front of you somehow when the work that you have to do is, is uh, a lot more immediate and a lot less dramatic. One of the reasons why, and we'll go back to the history, but I wanted to just mention that one of the reasons why Sergio and I had opened the community center following the 2016 election was for those precise reason, reasons. After, you know, mobilizing for a long time with the anti-war movement, uh, participating in Wisconsin, working with Occupy, working with Black Lives Matter, working with environmental movement, going to Standing Rock. I mean, after all of these mobilizations and these big, you know, uh, 
ideals that were espoused within them, um, we were, you know, faced with the reality that Donald Trump had won the election. And so we sort of stepped back and asked ourselves, how do we dig deeper? And some of the uh, conclusions that we came to were very similar to the ones that you had mentioned. I mean, we're looking at a, at these cities that have been blown apart by deindustrialization, cities that were created around factories, you know, places like Gary, Indiana, um, and those communities no longer existed. We had a very, now we have a very transient population of precarious workers. Yeah. They might live on the block for 12 months and then they move. Yeah. It's very hard to create connections with people in that context. And also some of the things you mentioned, uh, you know, about, uh, offshoring jobs. I was interested yeah. to, to see, you know, what were you experiencing working with those, with the labor movement, how they were responding to technological changes in the eighties were those conversations you were having at the time around automation. And then also for those who are younger, you know, there was a time when people were driving around in this country with bumper stickers that said, don't buy Japanese instead of don't buy yeah. Chinese, you know, like people might see yeah. today. Yeah. How, how did you deal with that within the movement? How was that dealt with? Or were those issues well, even broached, you know? Uh, this thing about parts of the East and, and Rhode Island is a wonderful example, is a deep fatalism about the decline of industry and the continuing reality of a blue collar life and the popular expectation of, of upward mobility being slight, something which anticipated the 21st century, but was very much on hand. Uh, so uh, that the possibilities uh, were uh, limited, constrained, but it also introduced a, a degree of, of modesty into what we were trying to do. One of my best friends who went to a theological seminary and then became a steel worker and a Maoist for a short time in the early 70s, uh, and uh, the lead person in safety and health for the state, spun off with another group that he created called Injured Workers of Rhode Island, otherwise known as I Worry. And it was a connection with the hundreds, actually thousands of people who had suffered mainly uh, injuries within uh, factory life and had one arm or one leg or lost something else. And uh, it was so much work from the bottom up as I uh, interviewed some of these people for a a, a book of oral history that I created, Working Lives of Rhode Island, that as they described their situation to me, I said, Jesus sounds so much like AA. And the fellow with one arm said, of course, we all went through AA first (laughs) uh, and then got the injured workers of Rhode Island. Not only only did it demand more services for uh, injured workers, but it also lifted their spirits in a way that traditional uh, successful American radicals, uh, Debs or Norman Thomas, or uh, the people since have lifted the spirit of the inhabitants in themselves, gave them a, a, a way to see a, a, a broader something and encourage them to pull their lives together and, and imagine a different future. So in a way, if you've lost this giant vision you for a while or you have to put it aside you you can focus on the the smaller things and those smaller things involve uh, people who really do need your help who are displaced uh but are uh, alive to or awakened by the possibility of uh, of social change and since republicans were always few in rhode island it wasn't too difficult for these people to see uh, that the conservatives are hopeless, but that the Democratic Party was also hopelessly corrupt. So you had to try to create different avenues of expression around that. And uh, it was at the very least uh, worth the effort. Uh, But for me in this time, having put so much effort into the transnational vision or pan-African vision in the 60s and and 70s, I found myself returning to uh, CLR James, who was advancing into uh, old age and did not have a biographer. Uh, uh, I was called upon by uh, Verso Publishers in London to come fly, spend a week with uh, CLR James and and write the biography, which would hopefully appear before he died. And it did appear a few months before he died in 1989. 
uh, and to use that biography to express the uh, hopes that had existed in the colonial, anti-colonial movement, hopes that were being dashed by the return of, of American hegemony and the defeat of the of the revolutionary forces being forced into by the IMF and the World Bank to end up in retrenchments that, that ended up with the same damn neo-colonialism, uh, but also to pick up uh, CLR James's great contribution, which is the radicalism in sports, how the rise of of cricket and uh, cricket among non-white populations had been for them a proof that they were uh, equal to a- any task and deserved full equality. Uh, only sporadically had the left taken uh, sports, the role of sports very seriously. People began to look at it more uh, by this time. And I'd done a, a day of interviews with Walter Rodney, I'm sorry, Lester Rodney, who had been the sports page editor of the Daily Worker, the communist paper for 20 years, and a very close to Joe Lewis, uh, and uh, who had a real granular sense of what sports meant and could mean in uh, American life for reform and radical forces. And, and uh, certainly uh, the steps taken by uh, NFL and NBA players this summer during Black Lives Matter uh, is uh, a, a really dramatic example of the possible effects of sports. And Dave Zirin, another contributor to the Encyclopedia of the American Left, is, is, is a, has been a master at describing the, these events and their significance. But uh, those of us who were trying hard to think deeper beyond our usual boundaries by the 1970s and 1980s were pushing in that direction as well. It makes a lot of sense. It gets back to a point you noted earlier about the left sort of being detached from a lot of the pop culture that ordinary working class and poor Americans engage with. Absolutely. And some of this uh, goes back to a, a, an unfavorite topic of mine that is a, a favorite topic to, uh, uh, to to pick a fight, which is the uh, power of the so-called New York intellectuals milieu, uh, both to displace the popular front communist uh, influence uh, and progressive influence, Henry Wallace influence on uh, a change uh, by a, a view that was far more skeptical about social change, except the social change that could be achieved within the Democratic Party, and also uh, quite hostile towards the campus anti-war movement. But in another vein, a, a, a subject to a romanticization of colonialism past, especially British colonialism, and uh, hostile to popular culture as being somehow degrading, uh, and therefore insistent upon high culture and insistent upon abstract expressionism as the only possible acceptable form of art, uh, and so forth and so forth. And uh, it's not that we thought that these uh, more removed and even effete forms were uninteresting or should be condemned, but we were struggling to create space within the larger discussion for various things, but we didn't like the, the the perverse domination of the intellectual scene by the New York intellectuals. Now all that seems to be gone, although uh, aged new leftists like Todd Gitlin had planned to be the successors to uh, the New York intellectuals and took the same political stances uh, in support of the war of Afghanistan and against the left as being unpatriotic after 2001 and all those sorts of things that would be entirely continuous from the view of the New York intellectuals. Uh, Perhaps it was my background in middle America in Illinois, or my fondness for mad comics, or something else uh, difficult to describe. But we were trying to to chart out a a different course, and uh, we were faced with the reality that the prestige places like the New York Times and and then a New Yorker and others would always be dominated by these these forces, and, and people would take those seriously. And I turned to the pages of the Village Voice and became a writer for the Village Voice in the 80s, uh, and at the same time a, a writer for the nation. 
uh, in the village voice really it was about different uh, radical elements in, in in popular culture and in the nation it was a variety of things but it encompassed something that we have not yet perhaps talked about which is the rise of liberation theology an enormous uh, potential force in the 1980s because it, it appeared for a moment as if a sweeping uh, liberation theology building upon some of the concessions made within the Catholic Church, but going far beyond them and encompassing astonishingly radical bishops and priests uh, across many parts of, uh, of Latin America to uh, build a communal society outside of the consumer society that the, the U.S. had sponsored in the middle middle classes of those countries, but also to defend the rainforest and defend the ind indigenous people within it. And some of the priests took up took up the gun. Within ten years, uh, uh, blood, the, all, the entire movement of, Christ of liberation theology had been drowned in blood. The uh, degree of repression, the, including from within the Catholic Church, uh, and the degree of military repression uh, based upon uh, U.S. support of the of the Contras and various other kinds of things, uh, meant that uh, the promise of liberation theology, if not destroyed, was deeply undercut. And uh, I would say that some of the greatest hopes for dramatic reform uh, or radicalization in Rhode Island, the most Catholic state in the U.S., had been around liberation theology. And the, the few priests who were uh, uh, radicalized were working with us, and we were working with them. And uh, that, too, uh, went by the board temporarily. As new uh, Catholics came into this state, Dominicans from the Dominican Republic in very large numbers, and the the situation in front of us kept changing. But we were persuaded that ideas that we had picked at, that we sort of thought about, that were outside the familiar lexicon of the American left, nevertheless had to be pondered and dealt with some way or the other. Were the workers that you were working with at that time in the labor movement? conscious of what the Reagan administration was doing in Central America? And were, were there conversations taking place about those actions? Much less uh, because the economic situation was so difficult, much less than right. the radicalized priests and nuns and the immigrant populations themselves. It, it was surprising if we had a, an annual labor festival that the people would come up to you and talk about politics. And it was clear that they had been supporters of the left in Central America. And then, uh, you know, their movements were defeated or their families were desperate and they relocated to the U.S. And they were very cautious to express their ideas openly. But they were part of the new emerging working class that would take it, it take its own framework. And by the 1990s, uh, a socialist Dominican was in the city council and, and then in the state legislature and uh, hugely promising until he dropped dead at an early age. Uh, but uh, there were, uh, I would say that, that the uh, radicalized, uh, those who were radicalized by liberation theology were, were not so much in the Irish, Italian and other existing uh, working class movements uh, whose leadership and often most enthusiastic people were already in advanced middle age. How was the left responding to the decline of the Soviet Union during this time, at least in the circles that you were running with or what you could pick up, uh, you know, in, in recollecting the, that time? I'm interested what? in how the left yeah. was responding to the Soviet Union declining, the war in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's better to start with Polish solidarity. Uh, we had a, what I consider to be a very fine meeting, uh, public expression of support for Polish solidarity, as you can imagine, a Catholic state would take take the side of, of Polish solidarity and bringing Catholicism back. That's the way they saw it. Um, and the refugees from Poland uh, in 1981, uh, who set up in various cities in the U.S., they set up an office uh, close to down the hall from our labor support group. And they were extremely anti-Semitic. They were uh, extreme supporters of Ronald Reagan. 
and they, they and this office was in a, a a poor neighborhood, a black neighborhood, and they just hated being around black people. And that we sadly realized was all too typical of the support gathered for uh, uh, Polish solidarity after the first wave of of hopes. Uh, it settled into a, a, a kind of a labor conservatism that had been all too typical in the conservative uh, Catholic uh, a sector of, of labor leadership in the early 50s, which had been part of uh, raids on left-wing unions and establishing uh, Irish Catholic George Meany and his CIA connections as, as central to the way that the American labor movement would operate overseas and, and at home. So um, that's that. Uh, how did people see the oh, Contra Wars, for instance, uh, and uh, Contragate with Reagan? Uh, Rhode Island was carried by Ronald Reagan in 1984. It was the first and last time a Republican carried Rhode Island. Um, so uh, there was a lot of uh, conservatism, including labor conservatism. And it, it was something that, that uh, was uh, difficult to uh, to resist. And on the other hand, because it was so reactionary in the class terms, uh, it did not really successfully remain, and it was possible to make good arguments. Uh, but uh, again, our connections with the religious community, the younger community, the artistic community, which is very present because of the Rhode Island School of Design and the, and the gay and lesbian community for the same reason, uh, mainly, uh, offered some kinds of, of, of forces against that. The collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, it had so little effect in Rhode Island life that it, it didn't bypass us, uh, but it bypassed much of, of blue collar life. Right. Uh, and uh, the second wave of shocks, uh, the so-called shock uh, doctrine to transform the Russian economy into a privately owned uh, fief of uh, what appears now to have been warlords, but is more or less a new r ruthless brand of, of entrepreneurs or manipulators, um, would not have surprised any blue collar population in the world. Uh, the expectation that things are going to be different and democratic and so forth and so forth was held high even in Rhode Island by the American Federation of Teachers, who, who often saw the world as related to Israeli interests. Um, and uh, they, uh, did they even know that the AFT had set up a vastly expensive daily Russian newspaper to create a new labor federation based in Washington, D.C.? No, probably not. You know, right. cheerfully ignorant about all that stuff. And when that daily newspaper collapsed and the whole AFT effort to take over the Russian labor movement also collapsed, nobody would be surprised. Just more cause for fatalism. Right. How about your connection or if you had any or what you made of the Rainbow Coalition and Jesse Jackson? Uh, effort? Uh, now, this this was a, a source of, of um, hope, but uh, also uh, anxiety. Um, I joined DSA in 1984, and uh, that was a year in which socialists and progressives were very excited uh, about Jesse Jackson's first run. But uh, it really uh, did not have a social base, could not gain a social base within uh, Rhode Island. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't going to be able to get Jesse Jackson on the ballot, which would have been a, a, a critical move for the, for the, the primaries. Um, so uh, it, it, this, the larger sense outside was uh, the hopes expressed within uh, the newly organized DSA and the resentment of older socialists and social democrats uh, somewhat around DSA, but more more disorganized in their own increasingly neoconservative organizations of a real hate campaign against Jesse Jackson, which was very, very strong in, in New York State and very much based upon Israeli uh, inclinations. So we saw it. We thought it was wonderful. It was great. And if my memory is correct, uh, DSA 
uh, did endorse Jesse Jackson, and uh, certainly individual socialists worked very hard for him, and branches worked very hard for him. But it was a struggle. And likewise, in uh, Jesse Jackson's latest thing, the last big run, uh, 1988, the Rainbow Coalition seemed more a bit more solid and a bit more gained more energy. But Jesse Jackson wasn't on the ballot in uh, in Rhode Island. So, you know, we were uh, a, a, a society, a, a mini society with a, a population, a non-white population of under 10 percent. Uh, and a growing Hispanic population of uh, of very young people and not yet engaged with the uh, uh, with the campaigns this is sort of a, perhaps highlights before we uh, quite detached ourselves from the state uh, of the enormous energy for uh, Bernie Sanders, who carried Rhode Island hugely in uh, in 19 in 2016. There there was a, a reform energy, but it probably needed the sinking reality of uh, neoliberalism uh, and the voice of another New Englander, Bernie Sanders, uh, to begin to rally uh, a new generation of young people. I I wasn't in the state to take part in it, but it was a a moment and has continued to be a moment of uh, reform energy. And that means attacks on the existing totally corrupt Democratic Party. Let's go through the 88 to 92 period. Uh, Reagan had just finished his second term. His vice president, uh, George H.W. Bush, takes office in 1988. Uh, it, during his period, of course, we have uh, economic uh, downturn. We have the Gulf War. And then, of course, he's a one-term president. What, what were you doing at the time and sort of what, what do you recall from that period? Uh, it's a, a little bit analogous to the big, big, big Washington demonstrations uh, in uh, 1982 and 1983. Uh, one was related to the crushing of the um, air controller strike and of the air controllers, and the other one was related to the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. And uh, in both cases, the organizing around me. Uh, was to get as many buses together and go to Washington and do what you can do and then come back. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, our ability to do that was just fine for those days of of the long bus drive, but not uh, tremendous afterwards. By the time of the first Gulf War, I can recall another uh, Washington uh, bus drive with uh, the same, same kind of sense uh, but uh, deepened in uh, the first Gulf War by a, a feeling that the uh, right and the center of the Democratic Party were able to push back against the so-called Vietnam, Vietnam syndrome and were prepared for a new wave of U.S. invasions and, and uh, occupations of, of various countries. And we weren't wrong in thinking that. I had to have a dentist tell me I was grinding my teeth because I'd never done it before in my life. But he could hear me doing it in the dentist chair. It was the, that that dread prospect that was in front of us, uh, and uh, up t- uh, through uh, the Gulf first Gulf War, the ability to organize against it was was pretty limited. Uh, we did not yet find uh, the kinds of American casualties or the resistance within the armed forces themselves, disillusionment and all that sort of stuff that we were. We were going to see in in later years. There was always a rumble. Rhode Island was a state where youth culture hardly existed, aside from the use of drugs and the forces of of young people were full of men who came back from Vietnam on drugs and were a, a deep reality of Rhode Island blue collar life for the next twenty or thirty years. That 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 was our backwash of the of the war in Vietnam, and it never really left. Uh, so uh, the sense of, of peaceniks and reformers having wonderful national uh, connections and taking those buses to Washington and trying to build enthusiasm or taking a bus to New York City for something, all that was there. But the sense of, of being a fairly isolated community and the enormous difficulty of the connecting it with the labor movement and the scarcely existing civil rights movement or black rights movement, those were real factors to that. 
uh, I would add that it was typical of, of Rhode Island life, and it may not be too, too many of your uh, listeners, that uh, the large population among the new populations from the 1965 uh, Immigration Act change were Cape Verdeans. And the revolutionary success in Cape Verde and then the, the struggles around that success brought these big crowds uh, in the community not 10 minutes drive from me of uh, Cape Verdeans being uh, spoken to in, uh, in the Cape Verdean language for, which did not even exist as a dictionary uh, or at least as a dictionary with translations back and forth from English. So it was a, another immigrant wave of, uh, of non-white people who variously described themselves as Portuguese or black, depending on the era. They became more black and more involved with the Black Panther movement, and then later they became Portuguese again, according to the opportunities they perceived in front of them. But it was another great example of one of the misunderstood aspects of the American left, uh, that things had been organized uh, since the 1910s, but they'd frequently been organized behind closed doors and not in the English language, because those were the safest ways to organize things and to protect an immigrant population from being deported or being re repressed or facing some other kinds of uh, economic and social and, and, and political difficulties in their lives. Uh, the parts of the left never even saw these things happen and didn't know really how to relate to them it was qu quite a problem, but it's a reality, an old, old, old reality of the left in American life to to encompass and uh, and deal with in one way or another. What did you make of Clinton's rise to power? I, looking back, of course, it seems uh, maybe clear, maybe unclear that if Ross Perot hadn't had run in 1992, George H. W. Bush could very well have re you know but, been reelected. Uh, um, I think that's absolutely true. What, what did yeah. you make well, of this rise? Yeah, there are two of different ways to see this. One was uh, it was good to have a Republican, especially one who'd been the head of the CIA, uh, George W. George H. W. Bush, uh, out of office. Right. And on the other hand, uh, the success of only a Southern uh, white Democrat becoming president and bringing along with them the Democratic Leadership Committee, the the vanguard of neoliberalism uh, was uh, ominous. And the more you looked, the more ominous it was. Uh, the AFL-CIO leadership, which had since the middle 70s devoted a larger budget to overseas intelligence agency-related operations than to its own domestic budget, because they got the money from the outside for those overseas operations, had, had in a way given up on organizing any further working class people in the U.S. There were some little attempts, but basically the big push was toward public employees. And when that push seemed to get as far as it could, then they retract and, retracted and, and defeated. And as the factories closed, instead of it somehow radicalizing the labor movement, it made the labor movement and its leadership more and more conservative. And the person that took over from George Meany, Elaine Kirkland, had been, from what we can tell, connected with intelligence agencies since the beginning of his career. And it was said that uh, less than 4% of the unionized people in America recognized Lane Kirkland's name. And that made perfect sense. He wasn't somebody from the labor movement. He was somebody who'd been placed in, in the leadership of the labor movement from the outside. So that the Palace Revolution of 1995, with all of its limitations, but for the first time refusing uh, the leadership, uh, which had, had normally been done in military fashion, everybody follows the orders of those above, was uh, very dramatic. And uh, DSA members, uh, some DSA members were, were deeply involved in the organizing of it, uh, seemed tremendously hopeful in the same way that a, a sister development, scholars, artists, and writers for social justice, S-A-W-S-J, Sausage, uh, 
was very hopeful for about two years. We had very big meetings on campus and community. Sections of the labor movement seemed eager to engage in all kinds of new social and environmental activities. Lots and lots of intellectuals and students were involved. And then the, uh, the new AFL leadership lost interest and students went back to being involved uh, with whatever they were being involved with in local kind of reform activities and students' rights and, and problems on campus and deaths and so forth. And all of it uh, disappeared as if a mirage. And along with that, the uh, efforts to create a labor party, which were strong in the 1990s, uh, and then it fizzled uh, by the year 2000. Let's talk about that, because there's something that people are bringing up today. I mean, there's a question on the left. There's probably three questions as it relates to electoral politics. One approach would be, let's not mess with it at all. Let's spend most of our time mobilizing in the streets, workplace organizing, et cetera. Another view might be, we need to take over the Democratic Party. And then a third view might be, maybe a fourth, but the third would be, we need to create a new party. And then a fourth possible alternative would be, a sister parallel institution that would operate like a party, but run people in races under whatever banner they would want to run them under. Um, We are facing a similar question today. Uh, I wonder what are the lessons that you took away uh, from the Labor Party experiment? Well, uh, you know, there was very, very weak support for Tony Mazzocchi's vision of a Labor Party in the the 1990s. I, I thought it was a great idea. But uh, beyond his oil, chemical, and atomic workers, uh, there wasn't really very widespread support for it. From you know, from existing labor leaders had given up organizing campaigns and therefore become ever more reliant upon electing Democratic politicians and not necessarily progressive Democratic politicians. So uh, that uh, and the uh, the enormous difficulty of creating a uh, any kind of labor base or broader base for the green party beyond the personal appeal of of uh, of Ralph uh, these things were extremely daunting and in the face of some inroads within sections of the democratic party as, as i've said uh, dominicans uh, beginning to have some weight in uh, in rhode island the prospects for for going outside and staying outside seemed really difficult. Although at the same time, the you know, the uh, labor party type or the family uh, working family party uh, had some had some weight, and has finally made some impression in Rhode Island much more than in uh, in in Wisconsin. Um, so that. Working from uh, within as well as outside the Democratic Party is the fait accompli. It isn't as if there's another golden path. But on the other hand, uh, the likelihood is uh, from Black Lives Matter that the great events, the large events, are just as likely to happen in the street as anywhere else. And that the ideas and feelings and mobilization that uh, people manage will have the effect of influencing the labor party influencing the democratic party prompting the democratic party to to do what it should always have done which is to find its natu- natural con- consistencies um and uh, will it, is it willing to do that is it able to find those constituencies uh and mobilize them i think that probably is the the question for today I am I think we're going to round this out, and I want to come back to something I, I neglected in my uh, in the first uh, talk we had together. I couldn't reference uh, the heavy influence of my childhood, and that is the Johnny Appleseed, John Chapman. Uh, I managed to produce a, a comic about his life several years ago, and it didn't sell very well, but it, it's meant a lot to me, uh, expressing a different road, the road that uh, American so-called settlement, Euro settlement, didn't manage to do, a different way of looking at life and the prospects for a, a, a cooperative society. I think that and, uh, Johnny Appleseed, John Chapman, died in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, in 1845. Um, 
the possibility of the utopian uh, notion that this could result in something better instead of something worse. Uh, that's a, a very large thought, and it's a thought that has remained with me from my childhood onward, and I hope has been expressed in various ways in the dozen graphic novels that I managed to bring out with with various artists. Uh, anyway, it's you know it's my contribution along with the Encyclopedia of the American Left to offer a a, a helpful gift to those who follow. Well, it seems like a difficult time to even imagine uh, utopian alternatives. I think one of the challenges we face is maintaining the hope that resides in those ideas while also doing our best to ameliorate the pain that exists for so many people. Um, it, it seems to me, now I've been involved with left politics for the last 15 years, so not nearly as long as you have, but it does seem to me that the movement is much more sophisticated than it was 15 years ago, even 10 years ago. And yet we still, you know, are, are wrestling with these contradictions, contradictions that might exist forever. But, you know, how much can you get accomplished? How much does that utopian vision uh, both motivate people, but then also potentially let people down if indeed you're not able to achieve those ends? I think those are things we An constantly old, grapple old, with. old uh, question that used to be said that, uh, turnover in socialist and communist parties in Europe was maybe 15% a year and maybe 75% in the USA. Hmm. People join expecting big things to happen right away. They don't happen and people drift away. Uh, American radicalism has been extremely explosive and at the same time uh, uh, extremely uh, inclined towards sharp, sharp declined so, so sharp that it seems like a disappearance. But I will say that since the Bernie Sanders campaign of, of 2016, uh, and since the rise of uh, AOC as, uh, as an icon, that thousands, tens of thousands of young people in particular ha do have a new notion. Uh, I think this builds upon uh, Occupy and the earlier Black Lives Matter movement, a, a sense that movement in the streets really can have an effect uh, and that the effect is not only in changing society, but uh, uh, giving people an opportunity to feel the change in their own life, a expression of, of a possibility in their own life. I come back to my first experience of college teaching as a teaching assistant in Wisconsin in 1967, students believed, young people believed that they could change society. And that gave them an, an intellectual interest, but also gave them a psychological power that they lost after 1980. But in, unless I'm mistaken, uh, in 2016 and, and after, many thousands of young people have gained that same kind of sense that they as young people can change society. At any rate, that's one of my most hopeful thoughts. I will, I'll allow us to stop with a hopeful thought because I, I feel somewhat mixed. I feel somewhat <laughs> conflicted on that because in other words, let me say this, Paul, I would agree with yeah. you before COVID and before Bernie lost to Biden. Now the question that we ah. face is, you know, we had a lot of momentum um, yeah. leading up to that. Now, after nine months of not being able to organize under, you know, it's difficult to organize under normal conditions, uh, so-called right. normal conditions. Trying to organize over the last nine months has been virtually impossible. Uh, and then weighing on that has been the fact that Joe Biden represents the Democratic Party right now yeah. and the fact that he barely won this election. I don't want to, how do I say this? I don't want to... <laughs> downplay at all what you're saying because I agree with you and I think that those seeds of hope do still exist but I also I guess I'm reluctant to um, assume that they're maybe as strong as you feel they are that's that's all I'll say I don't, uh, yes. don't want to dash your all, hopes. all I would say is all I've said at various points in my life we don't know what's around the next corner yeah that's the smartest thing <laughs> you're the wisest person we've interviewed <laughs> Okay. Everyone else, hey, everyone else we interview wants to pretend like they know what's around the corner. You're the wisest person <laughs> we've interviewed so far because you're the only one that admits you don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, hey, uh, Paul, I did want to mention one last thing. 
the next inter- sure. the next interview I would like for us to start at nine eleven and and go from there, if that's okay. Sure. Um, and By the other means. the other thing I was going to mention that. is a friend of ours, Kim Sipes, is a good friend of oh, yes. S- Sergio and I's, and I know he's done a lot of work on the AFL CIO's foreign oh, policy. Great work. Okay. Great work. Great work. Okay. Small handful of people willing to take it on, and uh, he's one of those people. And he's like you; he's a military vet. He is. He's a good friend, and he lives about a mile away from me. <laughs> All right. Talk to you again later. So All right. Long. Take care, Paul. Hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you could become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P A R C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.